I can't believe I'm presenting at TEDx Buffalo. Ah, oh, what are the odds? How did a monster ever make the big time? Oh, are we streaming this? Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hi, Aunt Pam. Uh, hi, Mr. Johnson. Hi, Dr. Bob and Dr. Matt and, and Dr. Summer and, and Dr. McNally. And, oh, gee, I have a lot of doctors. I'm allergic to a ton of stuff. Bananas and rubber gloves and... Achoo! Oh, fur, too. Uh, anyway, my name is James M. Scrapladder, but you could just call me Scrap. My presentation today is on the mathematical formulations of quantum mechanics. And what better way to start a talk off like this than with a light-hearted joke? Do you know what they say about the mathematical formulations of quantum mechanics? Who cares? It's all relative to me. <laughs> scrap, scrap, hold on. This is my TEDx talk, not yours. Keep quiet down there. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Uh, uh, as I was saying, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cameron Garrity, and I am ruining my presentation. S scrap, you know they're still serving lunch out in the lobby, right? They are? You mean I could go get seconds? Yeah. See you, everyone. Bye. James M. Scrap Ladder, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Cameron Garrity, and unfortunately, I will not be presenting on quantum mechanics today, but rather, as you may have guessed, about the power of puppetry. Puppets make the most successful fictional characters in all of history. Let me say that again. Puppets make the most successful fictional characters in all of history. Puppets can tell stories better than anyone. That's partly because who doesn't love a green four-eyed monster like Scrap? But more to the point, it's because puppets have been telling stories longer than anyone or anything. We're being cheated by our technologies today. We get stories told to us in more ways than ever before. Facebook, YouTube, Hulu. There's too much quantity and not nearly enough quality. We're spoiled by the, the stories that we see on our computers, our laptops, our various devices. Before this more recent technology, we were cheated by the stories we saw on our televisions, and, dare I say, we were even cheated by books. Because before we received books and the written language itself, we had puppets tell our stories, illustrate our stories, and bring them to life. Not too many people realize this, but the art of puppetry is almost as old as storytelling itself. It dates back to civilizations and families gathering around a fire and passing on canon from one generation to the next, whether it be historical, fictional, or even religious. And it's in the same really rich tradition that puppeteers continue today, to move our audiences both emotionally and affectionately using the puppet tool, which again, I argue, makes the most successful fictional characters in all of history. Now, when talking about puppetry, it usually helps to immediately point out the elephant in the room or since we're talking about puppetry, maybe the snuffleupagus in the room. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult to talk about puppetry today, at least in the contemporary setting, at least in America, without also talking about the Muppets. They've kind of become the gold standard by which we judge a lot of our contemporary puppetry today. And there's a very good reason for this. The Muppets did a lot of things right. Jim Henson, Frank Oz, the guys who created it back in the 50s. But so much of what made the Muppets successful is what made puppetry that came before the Muppets successful. The Muppet characters are just the most recent examples in a very long lineage of successful puppet, performer, uh, puppet characters. The Muppeteers are just the most um, recent um, uh, descendants in a very long line of, of this great history. Now, I, I myself have been a Muppet fan my entire life. Some of my earliest memories as a child are sitting in my living room and watching Muppet VHS tapes, Kermit Puppet on hand. Now, I'd like to share a story with you from my childhood that I heard a lot growing up. And it, it illustrates a nice point about the magnetism that these characters have and how they sometimes inadvertently affect our audiences. So let's take a trip back in time to the year 1991, when little Cam Garrity was only about four or five months old. And my mom and my grandparents wanted to take me to the mall for the very first time, the, the Eastern Hills Mall. Now, it's important to know that I'm my parents' oldest child, and on my mom's side, I'm the oldest grandkid. So the mere thought of taking a newborn baby anywhere was a fairly fresh experience for everyone involved, as I'm sure you can imagine. 
But things were going pretty well for a while. I got some new clothes, tried some new food, and then an hour into the trip, my mom and my grandma went off somewhere, probably just to the bathroom or something. I was left alone with my grandfather. God love him. He had not been that close to a baby in over 20 years. So he did what I imagined any new grandfather would do and took me to the toy store. The instant our stroller passed the threshold of the KB Toys that afternoon, I began to cry. I was screaming. I was downright inconsolable. My grandfather, having not had to deal with a baby in nearly 20 years, did what I imagined any new grandfather would do. He began pulling every toy off the shelf he could possibly find until one would eventually shut me up. So he tried a lot of different things. Teddy bears, stuffed animals, choo-choo trains. When he tells the story, he says he was even so desperate as to try a Barbie doll. Fortunately, that did not work, or else this would be a completely different TED Talk. <laughs> um, but finally, we made our way to the Sesame Street section, and he pulled this Big Bird doll from the shelf. The instant I got this thing in my arms, I was quiet. I was silent. I was downright content. In that instant, I had made a new best friend. My grandfather, finally getting the hang of dealing with a baby after 20 years, did what I imagine any new grandfather would do, he bought that toy for me on the spot to ensure my silence for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> now, a couple months after this all went down, uh, I began talking. After my obligatory first words of da da, a very close second was da dord, which meant big bird. Growing up, puppetry continued to be a particular fascination of mine. It was something I was always incorporating into school projects and extracurricular activities. Uh, and when I reached the collegiate level, I was fortunate enough to receive a grant from Damon College, which allowed me to study puppetry throughout the country. And in case anyone was wondering, to this day, Dodord remains my all-time favorite Muppet. So how does something like this happen? What was I, as a future puppet enthusiast, catching on to all the way back then? I believe, yes, at that early age, I was tapping into why puppets make the most successful fictional characters in all of history. That reason being, puppets are real. Now, I don't mean this in any kind of weird or schizophrenic way, but it's true. Puppets are real. <laughs> they are physical. They are tactile. You can reach out and touch them. This fact alone registers with us as an audience, at least on some kind of subliminal level. When a puppet is performed, we're all able to sit back and relax. Exhale. Take a sigh of relief because we're seeing something that hasn't spent hours in a render farm. Let's review a social script for a moment. If you were going to have a conversation with someone, what do you do? You sit down with them, you look at them in the eyes, you talk back and forth for a while, and at the end of the conversation, you either shake their hand or give them a hug, depending on how well you know the person. We can do this with a puppet. If I could call my uh, assistant Liz out here, please. We've got Scrap again. Hi there, what's your name? My name's Liz. Liz, nice to meet you. You enjoying the talk so far? Yes, my favorite part Isn't was Isn't this that wonderful? Even though I'm just an illusion, she's still having a conversation with me. Now, granted, there's that puppeteer attached to me, and he gets a little weird. But after some initial shock, things are no different than if she was talking to, say, George Clooney. Except, of course, it is different than if she was talking to George Clooney. I'm much better looking. But anyways, she could look at me in the eyes. I would look back. She could say something to me. I would be able to respond. I think I love you, Scrap. Quite down. I'm trying to make a point. And at the end of our conversation, I would be open-armed, ready to give her a hug. I'd like to see SpongeBob try that one. Thank you, Liz. Give her a round of applause. Can I get a show of hands how many people have seen the Today Show? OK, some of you, um, probably more of you. Uh, but let, let's, let's uh, think about the fact that the Today Show is an opportunity for celebrity guests to come on plug whatever TV or movie thing they're doing so that we as an audience then know to go out and, and see them in it. So let's speak in hypotheticals. If Toy Story 4, number four, was going to come out next month, who would sit on the Today Show couch with Matt Lauer? Would it be Woody the Cowboy or would it be Tom Hanks? If history serves, it would be Tom Hanks because Tom Hanks is the celebrity. Woody the Cowboy is just the character that Tom Hanks performs bringing the fiction to life. If there was some kind of segment where the computer animated Woody came on the, 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 the Today Show, things wouldn't feel quite right. We know that Woody is just computer data, nothing more than zeros and ones. Things would feel kind of stiff and sweaty in the same way we all exhale when we see a real puppet in our space. When we see an animated character in our space, 
there's an awkward disconnect because we know, at least on that subliminal level, that it's not real. We know Woody is not a tangible object in that situation. Now, animation in my argument is a really easy target. So let's switch our focus to live action, specifically Batman. When the new Batman movie comes out, who's going to sit on the Today Show couch? Will it be the Dark Knight or will it be Ben Affleck? It'll probably be Ben Affleck because Affleck is the celebrity, whether it's Batman or whether it's Argo or whether it's any other movie that Ben Affleck is starring in. When those movies end, when the credits finally roll, we're given closure. We don't need to see Ben Affleck again, at least until the next movie, when Affleck gets replaced by another actor who will inevitably disappoint Twitter. <laughs> but for now, Affleck is our guy. He could answer all of Al Roker's questions like, who is the biggest diva on set? How's life with Jennifer Garner? Congratulations on your wedding anniversary. Affleck is the hardworking, trained actor who brings the fiction to life. Now, using this exact same logic and not changing a single thing, when the new Muppet movie comes out next March, we're all going to be really, really excited to see Eric Jacobson on the couch, right? Nobody's ever heard of Eric Jacobson? Oh, that's strange. Well, then you must have heard of Matt Vogel. You in the front row. Bill Beretta? Dave Goles. David Redman? Of course not, because nobody cares who David Redman is except for me and like 2% of crazy Muppet fans out there and maybe David Redman's mother. <laughs> we don't care how hard it was for Steve Whitmire to keep his arm up in the air for 12 hours a day. We want Steve Whitmire sewn into the Today Show couch with his arm through the cushion performing Kermit the Celebrity, who we all know and love. It's Kermit we could ask our questions to about 12 hour days on set. How much of a diva is Miss Piggy in real life? My condolences on your wedding anniversary. And this is crazy. We're talking to a green sock about a block of foam and a bad wig. But, but this is what the Muppeteers want. That's what all puppeteers want. That is the power of puppetry. Puppets give us an excuse to believe in a fantasy that coexists with us in our real world. This is again what allows me to argue that puppets make the most successful fictional characters in all of history. Now, I've been talking a lot about what the Muppets have done and what makes them real, but this argument extends out to the whole world of puppetry because all puppets are real. If all puppets weren't real, a German puppeteer wouldn't have been pardoned for a performance full of heresy simply by contending, it wasn't me, my puppet said it. If all puppets weren't real, Queen Elizabeth II wouldn't have arranged for Joey of Warhorse to salute her at her Diamond Jubilee. If all puppets weren't real, when I went on to local television to promote a puppetry festival that I hosted through Damon College, the studio's technical director wouldn't have tried to put a microphone onto Scrap instead of me. <laughs> and speaking of Scrap, I think he has a few final things he'd like to say. And you're all incredibly lucky that puppets are real. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really, really easy to write us puppet characters off as fake. It's just a pile of socks and cloth and a couple of ping pong balls. To not buy into our illusion. But I ask you to just accept the fact of why puppets make the most successful fictional characters in all of history. I ask you to believe in the fantasy that us characters play in your lives the magic and the wonder of all puppet characters. Right down to tucking your four-month-old kid in bed at night with the new Big Bird doll that his grandfather bought him at the Eastern Hills Mall and realize that they have a real, lasting, sustainable good that will last with them for a lifetime. And that is the power of puppetry. Thank you, everyone.